Good morning, family. Good morning. Ooh, I like it. It's great to see you today. I hope you're all doing well. And I have to just get this off my chest right now, right up front. Let's not place Easter above the resurrection of Jesus. Right? I mean, really, Easter, the very origins of it, the very beginnings of it, find its way all the way back to Babylon. And the goddess that they had created, her name was Ishtar, fertility goddess. And they celebrated the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the spring solstice. And we carry that tradition on all the way so many thousands of years later that that's why we have such a variance of Sundays. It just depends on which Sunday falls on that day. But see, the beauty of God is, is that he didn't, he didn't just say, now there's one Sunday out of the whole year. Here's the date that I want you to celebrate the resurrection of my son. No, no, I want you to do this every first day of the week. I want you guys to gather together and worship and fellowship and love and share with one another. That's what I want my family to do. I don't want to pigeonhole this world-changing event to just one Sunday. I want you guys to celebrate it every week, every day. And so that's what we're doing here this morning. We're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ and we're here together to do that, and we want to welcome those of you who are visiting this morning. And I'm not throwing shade. You want to have eggs and baskets and, oh, Reese's. <laughs> oh. I have not had one of those eggs yet this year. Reese's eggs, we're going to have to get one at least. You know, I can just a little cheating on the diet. Yeah. So go for it. But, but, but don't. Don't mix them up. Don't, don't put them side by side as equal. They're just not. One of the things of the many things that I appreciate and, and are, I'm just grateful for the shepherds, the leadership here in this congregation, we're focusing on facts, truth, kingdom building. They're not about just having a gathering on Sunday that, that, that this religious organization gets together and, 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 and that's about it. This, this churchianity stuff is not what this eldership's about. We're about living a life sacrificed back to our King, Jesus Christ, to love him, honor and worship him with all that we are. And the reason why we do that is because we know that it's fact. We know Jesus is raised from the dead. We know the Bible is the word of God. We spent much of last year showing and proving that there are external writers of history from the first century that have to acknowledge that not only did Jesus live, but he was crucified. And oh, yes, they saw him alive again after his death. Even the secular historians had to say, well, you know, he lived. Lives. Now, what God blesses us with, and it's one of the greatest challenges that all mankind faces, is free will. Now we have to choose whether we want to pursue, seek, and follow Him. And to pursue, seek, and follow the facts of His Son being raised from the dead and everything that goes along with that. That's the choice. And he doesn't want somebody lukewarm. He wants somebody either to make the decision, not perfect, not perfect people, but imperfect people making the choice that I choose Jesus. And Lord, I choose your word and it is right and beautiful. And I want to seek it and learn it and, 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 and be filled with your truth and spirit every day. Those folks who pursue Christ and give themselves to him the way he teaches, man, now, now we're on to something. Or... Don't, but choose for yourself whom you will serve. And this congregation, these people, this family, we choose Jesus. 
And so if you are visiting today, we welcome you to a family that with that choice comes so many wonderful blessings. One of those things is, is that we share in this family. That God has blessed us with so many wonderful things, so many wonderful things he's, he's given us to, to share with one another because they all belong to him. And so here we are, sharing, caring, loving, having each other's back. Now, having said that, we have, and I'm not going to skip out on this, that the timing has worked out really well, that today we're going to focus, continue to focus on this kingdom building series. But it is a special message in tying it together, and I hope it's an equipping message for you. We focused on the Old Testament and the kingdom principle that God has put into place. The kingdom that belongs to God is a reality. It's not a cliche. As a matter of fact, that's what God is all about. He established, he created the heavens and the earth, and he creates this earth where he was at the very beginning with Adam and Eve, and it was his kingdom, and he was ruling and reigning over it, and he gave his people, Adam and Eve, everything they needed to flourish in life, and yet they still chose to sin against him. But God so loves us. He so loves us that he comes up with a plan. He does not want mankind to be lost. He doesn't want mankind to be separate from him. And although God had to go to a place that is called the kingdom of heaven, he sends back a plan, a plan to pay the price for the sins of mankind and those that choose to pursue and follow and give themselves back to him through his son will live with him forever and live within his kingdom on this earth. That was his plan at the very beginning. So we watched now the kingdom principle unfold in the Old Testament. We watched how the promise was given to Abraham, and we started learning about the principles, the concept of the kingdom, that there has to be a king to have a kingdom, there has to be a land to have a kingdom, there has to be a law to have a kingdom, and there has to be people to have a kingdom. And then we saw that in the reality of God's people throughout the Old Testament. But God, you see, he had a plan. Remember, he, was, he knew that that was a temporary, that was a fleshly, physical kingdom. He knew that someday he makes a promise to his King David. And he says, now, King David, there's going to be a person that comes after you and his throne is going to last forever. And so we've traced that promise all the way to the New Testament, to Jesus. We looked at the prophecies from the book of Daniel to give us the timeline, a specific timeline to get to the birth and the, the implementation of the kingdom of Jesus Christ on earth. We talked extensively about that. So then we get to the New Testament and we see this beautiful passage in Matthew chapter 2. Go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Matthew because we're going to see several passages here in Matthew. In Matthew chapter 2, we see now we're crossing into the New Testament. It's about God sending his kingdom. Remember, it's not a kingdom today made with hands of men. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's real. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, and what's their question? Hey, where's the king? Where's the king? Now, I talked about this the last time we had the message that I'm convinced that the Magi who were connected all the way back to Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, those Magi's lives were saved by Daniel, and I'm convinced they followed the teachings and the writings of Daniel so that they knew exactly the timeline that, that points to Jesus and the King of Kings and the kingdom that will never end. And so as the generations unfolded, they worked that plan until they knew, they knew, and they see a sign, they said, man, that's it, we now know it's time. And they show up to Jerusalem figuring that every Jew would be celebrating the coming of the king. They weren't. We get to chapter three, verse one. 
And now we have John the baptizer. And he says, now in those days, verse one, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, repent for what? Kingdom of heaven, heaven, man, it's at hand. It's within reach. He's going out and, 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 and cutting the pathway. He wants God does not want people on this earth to miss the king of kings. Remember, it's his plan from the very beginning. He wants us to live with him in the kingdom of heaven forever. To do that, he sends his son, King Jesus, to this earth to establish an earthly kingdom that is a spiritual kingdom. And that someday when... When our last breath takes place and and, and that that great day of judgment and the trumpet sounds that we shall all, all be called those that follow him into the kingdom of heaven forever. That's God's plan. He wants us to live with him forever. Do you? Then you're going to have to follow the kingdom plan. Jesus then comes on the scene. He's baptized. He's he's risen from the water. He receives the gift of the Holy Spirit. He goes off to the wilderness. He has a face-to-face with Satan, and he gets done with that. And in chapter 4, verse 17, after he's now beginning his ministry, it says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus, in verse 23, was going through all Judea, Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. That's what Jesus was about, preaching the kingdom. We're not going to go through this now, but again, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount is about the kingdom. Jesus wants people who are broken spiritually and know it to know that their home is eternity in heaven if they follow Christ the King. In chapter 6, Jesus has a prayer in the book of Matthew. And and within that prayer, he prays and asks Father for the kingdom to come. And in doing so in his prayer, he knows what he has to do. He has to die to make sure that kingdom on earth takes place because of what he does on the cross. We get to chapter 6, verse 33, and it's one that I think most of you all know. Seek ye first the... Yes, top priority, church. Seek first his kingdom. Not second. First. All about the kingdom. There's a warning in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father. You see, there is a condition, and it's that free will condition, and he lays out his plan, his kingdom plan, but but we have to choose, do I want to do it his way, follow his will, or do I want to follow it another way? And that way won't work. I want to be in the kingdom forever. How about you? Now we get to the book of John. We're getting there. Chapter 3. John chapter 3. And that's where we started with a scripture reading this morning. Because I've got a question for you. Those of you who are members of the Lord's kingdom know this answer, but this is a part of the equipping part. This this will help you because you and I are are about kingdom building. We're going out to seek and save the, who are they? That's right. And we want them to be in the kingdom. And there's no way they can unless it's through Jesus. I'm the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through Christ. Nobody does. And we want to make sure that they know Jesus and pray that they they free will choice, choose Jesus to be the center of their life. So we see now Jesus teaching, how do you enter the kingdom? Well, he teaches Nicodemus. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, 
he cannot see the kingdom of God. What did he teach in chapter 6, verse 33? Seek ye first. Here's a Pharisee, and it's a great opportunity. Pharisee, I want you to know, first priorities. You cannot enter the kingdom. You cannot enter it without being born again. Can't. Now, it confuses the Pharisee because, remember, the Jews were all about lineage. They're all about being born into. I was born into the nation of Judaism. I was born into the nation. I was born into the kingdom of God. You know, that's the way I enter in. Males on the certain day they were circumcised and that was the sign of being in the kingdom man they didn't have to do anything else they were in born in and so jesus is shocking this pharisee by saying no if you want to enter this kingdom the one that belongs to god you have to be born again what and so he jude nicodemus responds verse 4 And he said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Moms, (laughs) wouldn't want to go through that again, now would you? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter. Enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh, like into the Jewish nation kingdom, is flesh. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Remember, the kingdom that God has today through Christ is not made with the hands of men. It's not based upon what family you're born into. It's based upon people being born again through the water and God's gift of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. That's his plan. You want to enter the kingdom? You're going to have to be born again. You can't act nice, behave nice, not act good and behave good and earn your way in by showing up to Sunday service every Sunday for the rest of your life. That will not cut it. It takes somebody being born again. And this is such a great message of hope. Because I stand before you, as I've mentioned many times before, as a man who is broken, broken because of the sins that I've committed Guilt and shame shadowed my life for as long as I can remember. And then through God's grace and his love and his mercy and the way he surrounded me with lovely people of faith, they taught me and showed me what it really means to live a life that is born again. And they introduced me to Jesus and they showed me who he looks like and what he looks like, how he lives and loves. And I chose Jesus. Oh man, fought along the way. And since then, had bumps and scars and sins too, man, imperfect right here. You're looking at them. But I'm telling you what, man, because of what Jesus has done, what he's doing, what he will do, I'm going to spend forever in heaven with him so long as I continue to seek and honor and worship him. And you can too. So he surprises this Nicodemus. It's not about where you've been born into. It's about you being born again into. So now we fast forward then to Matthew chapter 16. And Jesus now is well within his ministry, well along his way. And in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is going around saying, hey man, what's the word on the street? Who do people say that I am? Verse 14, then it says, and some say, well, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, nor one of the prophets, but he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Church, who do you say Jesus is? Yes, the Messiah, God, creator. Simon Peter answered, well, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock, that statement of truth, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. I will give you, Peter, the keys to the what? 
kingdom, which has to do with being born again, because you can't enter the kingdom of heaven without being born again. And to be born again, it takes faith in Christ through him, and it takes water and the power of the Holy Spirit to both empower you and lift you up in newness of life. And Jesus is now teaching us what to watch out for. Peter, you now have the keys to this good news message. I'm handing them to you first. Now we're going to fast forward to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 22. Jesus is now getting very close to his death and he is now implementing what we call the Lord's Supper. It is also referred to as the Last Supper here by many. In verse 14, we find when the hour had come, Jesus reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and gave thanks, and he said, take share amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given to you. Do this remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten and saying, this cup is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Behold, the hand of the one who is betraying me is with mine on the table. In John chapters 14 through 17, we don't have time, but this is the time where Jesus goes off. The betrayer goes off. Judas does. And so Jesus goes and he spends some very quiet, private, personal, powerful time with his apostles. And, and, and he lets them know, listen, guys, I'm going to die, but I'm not going to leave you an orphan. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit in a powerful way to you men. And you're going to go out and spread the word. And then Jesus in chapter 17 prays. He prays to the father that people even to this day and beyond will believe in him through their word. God didn't want us to be uninformed here in 2024. He made sure that he gives us these historical accounts all the way from the Old Testament thousands of years ago, all the way till we see this time in Jesus' life where he's connecting all the dots. We know that born again of water and spirit to enter the kingdom. We know that Peter's got the keys to the kingdom or he will be given the keys to the kingdom. And we now know that Jesus is saying he's got to go. But when he goes, man, that's when everything's going to come around. And he's leaving his word behind to lead people. Now, back to John. I know we're, this is study. We, 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 we talked about this. We're studying God's word. We're not just people who show up to do religious stuff. We're talking about being people of faith through God's word. Verse 38, John 19. I'm sorry. My bad. Luke. No, I'm getting way ahead of myself time-wise. John chapter 18, I was right. John chapter 18, verse 38, 33 through 38. Jesus is now arrested and he's taken before Pilate. He's in the praetorium and they summoned Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? You're... Your own nation, the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore, Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am king. For this reason, I have been born, and for this, I have come to the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, so what is truth? Jesus acknowledges now before he goes to the cross that he is, in fact, the king. And he is. He is most assuredly the king. 
And he's not a king of some earthly thing where we're going to go out and fight other people fist to fist, knives to knives. We're fighting for the soil of the souls of the lost because there is a king. His name is Jesus. There is a land, and that's all the ultimately the promised land in heaven, but the land here on earth are the souls of mankind. And there's a law, it's the law of Christ, and they're his people, and that's us. And he wants us to go out fighting for the souls of the lost, to add them to the kingdom, his kingdom. Now, Jesus, as he makes this proclamation of being a king, we see them, they they take him out in Luke chapter Uh, 24, and they hang him up and they let him know with a sign over his head that he is king of the Jews. So it, it acknowledges to the people that even though they may not honor him as king, he's recognized as king. Jesus goes to the tomb. He's buried. And as he's buried in Luke chapter 24, we find this. Verse 1, on the first day of the week, early at dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found a stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of our Lord. They were perplexed about this. Two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. The men said to him, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. You know, we didn't have time to do this, but what's fascinating about this is to prepare the body of Jesus Christ, Joseph and Nicodemus wrapped the dead body of Christ. Isn't that something? Nicodemus, the one that we looked at all the way back in John chapter three, the Pharisee. But he took it serious. He, he He wants to follow G. He knows who he is. And so... He helps take the dead body of Christ and wrap him. And now three days later, first day of the week, there's no body in the tomb because he's risen. Church, I challenge everybody here, members and visitors alike, go home, read the text, find, find in scripture the several accounts of Jesus being raised from the dead, and then go look up secular historians in the first century and find, if you can find, and you will, secular historians writing about the same event. Because it's true. Jesus lives. Now, when Christ is raised from the dead, he goes about and he goes out and he, and he starts gathering his apostles together again. And he starts teaching them in verse uh, 36 of Luke chapter 24. He goes out in the midst of his apostles and, and they're startled. Verse 37, as they're startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit, he said, Jesus said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet? That is, I myself. Touch me. See. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. While they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? He gave them a piece of broiled fish and And took it and ate it before them. And and he said to them, these are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you. That all the things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. That's our road map. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day. And the repentance and forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. You, my apostles, are these, are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending forth a promise of my father upon you. But you're to stay in that city, Jerusalem, until you're clothed from power on high. Matthew 28, verse 18. Just listen, please. And Jesus came to them, the apostles, and said, All authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I'll be with you to the very end of the age. Listen up to Mark 16, verse 15. And he said to them, Go into all the world, preach the good news message to all creation. 
And he said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Those that disbelieve will be condemned. Acts chapter 1. Let's go there and we're going to be finishing up very soon. Acts chapter 1. Let's pull this all together. How do you enter the kingdom of heaven? Because it's about kingdom. How do you enter the kingdom of God? How do you do that? Well, you have to be born again. Nicodemus, Nicodemus, it's about being born again of water and spirit. Peter, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. Jesus dies. He's buried. He's raised from the dead. He tells his apostles, now, guys, here's the marching orders. I want you to go out into all the world. I want you to preach the, preach the good news message. What's the good news message? That lost souls can be saved through Christ and be added to his kingdom that's not made with hands. Jesus then is about ready to ascend. Watch Acts chapter 1. We pick up. This is picking up after the Gospels. This is Luke. Verse 1. The first account I composed, Theophilus, that's his gospel of Luke, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he was taken up to heaven. And after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen, to these he also presented himself alive after his suffering, by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days, and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. What did he say? Spoke to them about the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you, apostles, will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, empowering them to be able to carry on the ministry of Jesus. Verse 6, so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times and the epics which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the remotest parts of the earth. Now we're reading and studying a lot because I want us to see that this is a historical truth. It is not something that's a religious practice where we just get together and do a few religious things and have some religious artifacts and just enjoy that. No, we are a people of fact and truth. We are folks that love Jesus because we know he lives and we watch it unfold as we read God's word from cover to cover in context, historically, chronologically. And we're now at a point where Jesus, he ascends to heaven. And when he ascends to heaven, we know that the apostles are going to go to Jerusalem. We know that they're going to be equipped with power of the Holy Spirit. We know that Peter's going to preach the first good news message of the gospel. And he's going to have the keys to the kingdom. We know that it takes being born again of water and spirit to enter into the kingdom. And that's where we're at. We get to chapter 2. Verse 29. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us today. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him an oath, remember we studied this, we read this in the Old Testament, that one of his descendants was going to be on his throne He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, in which we are all witnesses, therefore having been exalted to the right hand of God on his throne, because he's king, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear, for it was not David who ascended to heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord, King, and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent. And let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. What for? For the forgiveness of your sins, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you, for your children, for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So those who received his word were baptized. And that day they were added 3,000 souls to what? 
his kingdom. And we'll take time later on as the series unfolds. The kingdom is the church. The church is the kingdom. The kingdom consists of those who are filled with the Holy Spirit, those who are washed with the blood of the Lamb, those that submit to the rulership of the King of Kings. Those of us, we are his kingdom. Part of it. And then it's not limited to the walls. No matter where we go, the kingdom goes. It's a spiritual kingdom. So we place him first, not presidents first, not places first, not people first. He's first. He rules over all things in my life. How about yours? Because he's the king. And now wherever we go, he goes. Wherever we go, his kingdom moves with us because it's a mobile kingdom. It's not limited to land on earth. And that's what we're a part of, church. Now, here's the thing, though. We've been called to go into all the earth and spread his good news message of the kingdom. But let's not get it backwards. Let, let, let's not just, let's not preach doctrine. Let, let's not, pre- well, we're a cappella first. That's how we preach first. Seek ye first the That's right. And so let's keep the priorities the way they are. I seek first the kingdom. And my king says, I go out. I'm going to live for him. I'm going to love him. I'm going to serve him. But what he wants me to do is to go out and spread his kingdom. He wants me to fight for the souls, the soil of the souls that are lost. He wants me to go teach them that he is raised from the dead because it's a factual, historical relationship. It's not one that's just a religious relationship. He wants me to go out and teach people that Jesus actually lives. We've got to know these things, church. People all around right now today, I can't even begin to imagine how many people today throughout the world are taking their last breath now. 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 And with that in mind, how many people that we know that we don't know when they're going to take theirs? See, there's an urgency of the message of the kingdom, church. Let's not be ashamed of the gospel. Let's not be ashamed of Jesus. Because in the text that I just want to read to you now, and there are, I wish we had another six hours First Peter 2, therefore putting aside all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander like newborn babes, like newborn what? Well, newborn born again babes. We long for the milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, not only your own salvation, but grow in the respect of knowing God's salvation and Jesus and wanting to go out and share that with the people. Verse 3, if you've tasted the kindness of the Lord and And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also as living stones, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. Remember, not made with the hands of men for a holy priesthood to to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That's our our, our job. We're, We're priests in God's kingdom to offer even ourselves as sacrifices, living sacrifices to him. Verse 6, for this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay a, in Zion a, a, a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builder rejected, this became a very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Watch this. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the what? To the word. That's the standard. And to this doom, they were, were all appointed. But, but you, you, I'm talking to the church. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. 
Brothers and sisters, it doesn't get any better than that. Our Lord just lays it out so clearly. We're in his kingdom, kingdom rules. He's the king. We've got this world out there that's lost. And we've got these wonderful opportunities to share the greatest news ever. Jesus lives. It's the greatest news. And don't get caught up in the fleshly stuff. Don't get caught up where you place politics and people and everything else first. Where you get off fighting about things that will one day burn up and go away. Let's get focused on souls. Because it's a spiritual kingdom. And that's what he wants us to be about. Fighting for people's souls. Not against them. And so church. I leave you with this. Last week, Matt did a great job on Sunday morning with a lesson. And of course, Jeremy and Matt did a great job Sunday evening too. I really appreciate what they did. Matt spent time in Romans chapter eight. And I just want to remind you of of many of the blessings and benefits that we have because we belong to him. That isn't just about, oh man, I've got to keep giving and giving and giving and giving and giving. Man, we receive so much more. I implore you to think about the Holy Spirit living inside of you and just how beautiful that is. The sacrifice that Jesus went through, the plan that God had to have him live in you. He's in you. He's in you. And then what that makes you then is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are now part of that kingdom temple. And collectively, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit as God's family. What a blessing that is. A blessing that we have each other, family. This is our first family, by the way. This is it. This is our first family. Our priority should be about the first family, caring for one another. And yes, when you're not born into the same household, it takes a little extra work to get to know each other. You know what that takes? Time, love, patience, dedication, commitment. You know what else we have? I know that on the day the trumpet sounds, This old dude's going to be raised from the dead. Because he says so. I got that going for me. You know what else I got going for me? Anytime, anywhere, I can pray to him. And even if I have no words to say, God in his spirit will speak on my behalf. Oh, and then if you keep on reading Romans chapter 8, there isn't anything that can defeat so long as I stick with him. So what is it that I fear? When I go out in the world and try to tell people about Jesus, what could I be concerned about? Nothing. The only thing I'm concerned about really is their soul, and I want them to know that Jesus lives. I don't want them just to come and be a part of the church. I want them to become part of the kingdom, to be a part of the kingdom. So remember, this is a 200 level type of stuff. This is about being equipped. This is about being taught. And this is about being a people who wants to go out and help people know Jesus. And so I'm hoping this springs forth some thought and desire for you to want to learn more on how to tell people about him. Go out and celebrate today, church, that you're alive because of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe bring a Reese's peanut butter egg this afternoon. No, my wife said no. Okay, no. (laughs) How can we help you? This is not just an informal, formal invitation. This is a reality. I mean, people need people. I, I know that some of you are struggling with stuff, man. And for those that have and have reached out, man, I, I hope you're finding that you're, you're you're receiving great help. But those of you who are struggling and not reaching out, do so today. There are so many people in this congregation with so many resources. We can help you. But don't sit in your misery. Reach out for help. And if you've been questioning about Jesus, you really want to, okay, preacher, I'm, I'm, I'm visiting today and and I, I came for this reason, but then you started intriguing me about the truth and the facts. I want to know more. Boy, I hope that's true. That's the case. Because we'll stay. We'll study this afternoon. I got plenty of coffee in the office. And I'm hoping that you'll find a place where you want to give yourself fully to Jesus by being baptized into him. And you'll be added to the kingdom by him.
as we stand and sing the song of invitation.